Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is John Roberti, and today's program is How Do They Get Paid? The FTC's Use of Monetary Relief as deterrent, Deterrence and Compensation. Recently, in the antitrust and, and consumer protection world, uh, there has been a lot of talk about something called disgorgement. And the reason it's come up is because there was a Supreme Court case recently that that said the FTC doesn't have the right to do this thing called disgorgement. Disgorgement basically is going and getting ill-gotten gains from folks that are defendants against the FTC. And the Supreme Court said the FTC can't do that anymore. So today, we have a, a former senior official from the FTC who's going to talk about you know, what that relief is all about, why it's important, and what the FTC may be doing going forward. My co-host today is Elise Dorsey. Hi, Elise. Hey, John. It's great to be here today. Elise, what are we doing today? Um, today, you know, we're going to have some fun. I think we're going to talk about monetary remedies over at the FTC. And as you mentioned in the introduction, this has been getting quite a bit of buzz lately. Um, monetary remedies like disgorgement have traditionally been a really important tool in the FTC's arsenal that have really helped the commission bolster its ability to, you know, deter unlawful conduct and protect consumers. Um, but a recent Supreme Court case addressing uh, the FTC's ability to actually, you know, go after these kind of monetary remedies like disgorgement um, changed the landscape here a bit. Um, so a lot of this has been in the news lately for some reasons that may or may not be surprising, as you know, we'll be discussing a little bit later on. Um, and our guest here today is an excellent expert with, uh, you know, a lot of experience in this space. I'm really excited to be for her to be joining us today. Well, who is that, Elise? Um, that is none other than the wonderful Lydia Parnes, who is a w- partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati, where she's the co-leader of the firm's privacy and cybersecurity practice. Uh, before joining the firm, Lydia spent several years at the FTC, where she s- served as director of the Bureau of consumer protection. In that role, she oversaw privacy and data security enforcement efforts and helped develop the FTC's approach to online advertising. Um, I have a special connection to Lydia because she was my office neighbor when I first started working at the firm many years ago. So I'm very thrilled for her to be with us here today. Uh, Welcome, Lydia. Elise, thank you. It's great to see you and it's great to see you as well, John. So, so Lydia, the, the the disgorgement thing we've been hearing about in the news, um, again, it it sort of has has raised a lot of a lot of interesting questions. I guess the first question I have for some of our listeners is, what is disgorgement? It's an awfully big word. What does it really mean? Sure, John. So, um, it it's really it's it's pretty basic. Um, the FTC traditionally has used disgorgement as a way to make sure that companies and individuals engaged in fraud don't get to keep their profits. So what they're doing here is disgorging ill-gotten gains. And you you know, kind of compare that to the other remedies that the FTC has in its kind of tool case. Obviously, injunctive relief, but on the money side, the commission can get civil penalties and um, can also, and and I should say civil penalties in limited circumstances. Um, And folks have probably heard a lot about that as well, because there's been some uh, talk among among commissioners about asking for broad civil penalty authority for any violation of the FTC Act. Now the FTC can only get civil penalties for rule violations and when a company violates an existing administrative order that it may be under. So, you know, civil penalties. The commission can also get redress. We can talk about that during the next couple of minutes in a very um, kind of burdensome process. I'm happy to go into that. But disgorgement is different. It makes sure 
that the bad guys can't keep the money that they've scammed consumers from. So I mean, a couple of thoughts. So that was super helpful. A couple of thoughts of things struck me. One is it seems like disgorgement is probably a remedy. I know it's used sometimes on the competition side of the FTC, but it seems it's probably more commonly used as a, as a tool in consumer protection. Uh, Lydia, is that, has that been your experience as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this goes back, um, math isn't my strong point, but I'm saying this goes back like 40 years or so. Um, in the early 80s, uh, the, the commission began relying on this very specific provision of the FTC Act, Section 13B, to disgorge um, those, Ill, those ill-gotten gains in very clear fraud cases. And, and it, it seems to me, again, again. that, that the disgorgement remedy, the making people give back what they've got, okay, that they, they got falsely. That seems to me to have two, at least two functions, right? One is um, the the compensation, getting people who got scammed their money back, but also deterrence, because I I, I think that the scorchment has been used in settlements, for example, to say, hey, if you ever do this again, we're going to give you a, a break on the amount you total the total amount you have to pay, but if you ever do it again, there's going to be a big avalanche that falls all over you. Is do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, y- yes, I, certainly the commission's, uh, f- first and best and I think highest use of funds that are disgorged is to get money back to consumers who have been injured. Absolutely. And there are many cases where that's just, it's not possible to do that. Uh, it's, you know, it may be that consumers were injured, uh, and they, they did suffer out of pocket um, harm, but it was very small and it would be just too expensive uh, to get the money back to consumers. And in other instances where the commission may not be able to identify who those people are. Um, in, in that case, the money goes to the treasury uh, it, it, if redress isn't possible. Uh, you know, typically when the FTC takes less than full disgorgement, it's because the defendant doesn't have any more money. You know, right. the, they're, you know, on the verge of, uh, of, of, of bankruptcy anyway. The, the, the scam has, you know, kind of taken its, its course. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it sounds like when the FTC has been pursuing disgorgement, it has very kind of specific cases in mind from what you've said, right? There's, you know, it's not, um, you know, a, more widespread use? They have something pretty concrete and specific? So, uh, you know, I think historically that's the case. Back in the 80s, um, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of, um, of our listeners today weren't born then or, or you know, maybe were in preschool. Um, but back then, uh, you, you know, the, the commission really focused on what I would consider some of the most hardcore fraud. The initial cases were investment scams, you know, companies that were selling um, oil and gas leases or gemstones or, uh, you know, uh, uh, other investment opportunities that were, you know, it was completely false. I mean, this was hardcore financial fraud. And it was, you know, fairly easy to persuade courts that monetary relief disgorging those ill-gotten gains was appropriate. Um, And I should say the FTC in seeking disgorgement was relying on, I mentioned this statute, Section 13B of the FTC Act, which only mentions injunctive relief. It doesn't talk about uh, giving the FTC the ability to obtain money. But the commission went into court and argued that federal courts could rely on their ancillary authority to issue um, kind of full equitable relief and as appropriate disgorge funds. And in those early days, the courts agreed. Um, I, I, one of the uh, kind of biggest cases 
was a case called Amy Travel. Uh, that was brought in the division that I was running back in the kind of later 80s. And it was a case involving uh, uh, telemarketing fraud, the use of telemarketing for a travel scam. But it was different than those investment scams. It, you know, in the investment scams, absolutely no value. Here, what was happening in Amy Travel, what was happening also, you, you know, trying to cheat consumers out of money. But what was going on is there was a failure to disclose, basically, that there were terms and conditions. Uh, Amy Travel was selling cheap airfare and cheap hotels. Uh, and they failed to disclose that there were lots of hidden costs. So it would really cost consumers much, much more than Amy Travel was claiming. And they basically couldn't get what was being offered. Um, that was a case, I believe this was the first case that went to an appellate court and the Seventh Circuit held that the commission could get monetary relief under Section 13B, even though the statute um, by its terms only referred to injunctive relief. Uh, yeah, and, and 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 that's where the Supreme Court said recently, well, can't really do that anymore. And it it I I think probably creates well some interesting challenges, right? Well, it 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 does. It's um it it's actually it it's interesting because I think that the commission stuck to kind of hardcore fraud for a long time and then slowly started expanding the use of 13B into um, other areas that we might consider to be more standard um, deceptive conduct, more standard kind of misrepresentations that may not have veered into uh, defrauding consumers. Um, Interestingly, the Supreme Court was dealing with two different cases. One was out of the Seventh Circuit, the same circuit that, de that decided Amy Travel, uh, FTC versus Credit Bureau. I, I believe um, that case may have been, um, I, I, I believe in that case, Credit Bureau was offering consumers free credit reports and fail to disclose that they were enrolling them in a negative option uh, kind of subscription program where consumers were going to be charged $25 a month. And they just didn't realize that. Uh, so, you know, FTC went to court, I'm sure fully expected to get an injunction and disgorgement. And the Seventh Circuit revisited Amy and said, you know, in subsequent years, the Supreme Court has changed its uh, position and has said a textual reading of statutes is, uh, is you know, kind of key. And that's what they did. They looked at the terms of 13B, but also at the FTC Act kind of writ large and all of the different ways that Congress specified the FTC could get money. And they said, if Congress wanted the FTC to get money under 13B, they would have said so. So um, uh, Credit Bureau was was a loss um, for the commission. That went up. The, the Supreme Court accepted cert in that case. Kind of shortly thereafter, there was a case decided by the Ninth Circuit, uh, Federal Trade Commission versus AMG. That was, um, you know, kind of similar facts, a payday lender, uh, who basically said to consumers, you can, you know, kind of borrow money and pay it off in a single payment, but also didn't disclose that the consumers were being enrolled in a negative option. And, and this kind of went on accruing uh, interest on a monthly basis unless the consumers affirmatively opted out. So the Ninth Circuit, interestingly, found for the commission. Um, but two members of the panel said, hey, we think that Seventh Circuit decision is the right way to go 
but we're bound by precedent in the Ninth Circuit. The Supreme Court took AMG up on cert as well, and then shortly thereafter dismissed the Credit Bureau case. So I, I, you know, it seemed to those of us who are watching this um, that the writing was on the wall at that at that point. Yeah, no, the, no, no question. question. And 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 you know, all the reports was it was a tough day in court for the FTC. And ultimately, Supreme Court went nine nine zero, I believe, with Justice Breyer, not the most conservative member of the of the Supreme Court, uh, writing the opinion. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. And it was. Um, you, you know, it was it was an interesting opinion, as as was the Seventh Circuit opinion. And for those of us who spent years at the commission thinking 13B was, you know, such an important way for stopping fraud, it, it was um, uh, a, a surprising read. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of one of the questions I had for you. That's some, you know, really interesting background on how, you know, the case has kind of percolated up to the Supreme Court. And so, you know, when the the Seventh Circuit first came out with its credit bureau decision, um, was that, you know, a bit jarring? Was it shocking? How What was kind of the reception to that? You mentioned by the time it got to the Supreme Court that, you know, the writing was kind of on the wall. And, you know, the unanimous decision that seemed pretty set by that point. But when this first started coming up again, was that um, surprising? Was anyone really expecting that? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll tell you, I read the Seventh Circuit decision and my reaction it is a very well reasoned decision. Mm-hmm. Very well reasoned. My reaction was, how did we, ha- how did we do it? I mean, for all of those <laughs> years, ha- how did we, how were we so successful in persuading, um, uh, courts to, to adopt this position? And I think, I think part of it was, you know, kind of earlier Supreme Court, um, D- decisions, which gave um, which gave the Court of Appeals, uh, you know, some basis uh, for for awarding um, m- monetary relief. But I also think part of it was the a- almost slam dunk nature of the FTC cases back then. They were um, they were so compelling. And, uh, I, you know, I think hard for, for judges to kind of say that, um, uh, that, that these consumers weren't deserving of, of receiving some, uh, redress for the injury that they experienced. I mean, these were basically, honestly, these were cases that otherwise could have easily been brought by the criminal authorities. So very unsympathetic defendants. Exactly. Um, Probably, I mean, could very well have influenced the court to find a way to yeah. to, to get consumers their money back. Yeah, 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 it sounds yeah, kind of like exactly the reason why the FTC was created, right? It was you know that kind of going to you know the heart of why it was there was to stop like that kind of uh, very totally just fraudulent um, unlawful behavior. So, so, so what now, Lydia? I mean, what what does what what should the FT what does the FTC do? What should it do? And, and how impactful will this be uh, on the FTC's mission to to help out consumers? Yeah, so um, a great question. I think it's a really hard question. So, um, so th- you know, I think the um, I think the commission has kind of strayed a bit, not just recently, but I'm going to say, you know, the past ten years or so. Um, they've been seeking money in, in cases where, where maybe congressional intent, um, might, might not be that strong, right? I, I mean, I, I think when you look at the statute and you really parse it out, Congress intended for the FTC to get money in, you know, kind of very specific situations. Um, I know the commission, uh, is, is interested in having 13B amended, uh, to give it, you know, kind of blanket authority to obtain money, uh, whenever there's a, a, a violation that's established. Um, and I think there's been, there's been pushback, uh, and, you know, kind of suggestions that maybe, um, the commission's authority under 13B should be limited to, 
its original use um, in, in really hardcore fraud cases. Um, you know, personally, I'd like to see that restored. It seems to me that that's, that was the right use of 13B. And, um, uh, and that's important for the commission, I, I think, to have that, have that authority back again. Right now, there are, uh, you know, some commissioners who have talked about partnering with the states, um, in some cases so that, uh, you know, the FTC can obtain injunctive relief and the states, uh, can rely on their UDAP statutes to get money. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose the FTC could, could, could partner with cr criminal authorities in the appropriate case as well. And I guess that doesn't lead to compensation, but, but it would help with the deterrence maybe. Right. So, um, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, uh, and, and that was definitely a project that, uh, that the Bureau of Consumer Protection had in the, um, early, uh, early 2000s when, uh, when Tim Uris was chairman, uh, to, you know, working kind of closely with, um, uh, with, with state criminal authorities with, uh, uh, and federal, uh, criminal authorities to, um, to refer over kind of the, the worst cases. Um, and that I, you know, I, I think that that is absolutely something that the agency should still pursue if it's not. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I just kind of had, you know, an, another question in terms of, you know, maybe the FTC pivoting to, you know, explore other avenues in terms of getting monetary relief. You mentioned, you know, at the beginning, uh, one of the ways they can get it is, you know, through violations of rules. Do you see the FTC kind of uh, maybe using some rulemaking to start filling some gaps in the future? I, I know that, uh, that uh, you know, again, there have been some commissioners who have, um, uh, spoken about rulemaking um, and, you know, uh, th think that that might be a good avenue to pursue so that they can get civil penalties. So, you know, the the FTC's rulemaking procedures are, um, they, they're, they're not like uh, APA rulemaking procedures. They are, you know, uh, much more burdensome. Um, for, for the agency, uh, to kind of complete a rule. And the FTC has been most successful in rulemaking where Congress has said, FTC, we want you to adopt a rule in this specific area and, uh, and has given the agency APA rulemaking authority to do so. They did that in the telemarketing rule, um, which, you know, has been, um, has been very, um, effective a very infect, effective enforcement tool. The thing is, civil penalties, very good remedy uh, when, when you have a rule, an existing rule, but it also doesn't let you get redress for consumers. And when there's, you know, kind of a large scam and there's really been serious consumer injury, you know, that certainly should be what the, I, I, I think what the FTC is, is um, trying to get. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think, I, and I know some folks at the FTC are real, real good, real good lawyers and and real dedicated. And I think a lot of what they feel really good about doing is just that, right? Helping the consumers get their money back. I mean, I, I know, I know, there's, you know, telling people to stop is important too, but it's a it's a it's a shame on on many levels. You know, certainly for the consumers not to be able to get their money back. For the for the morale of the agency not to be able to 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 do that as well, and I and I take your point on civil penalties, but even so, I I really believe the threat of disgorgement is a is a very very significant tool to deter bad behavior and rep, particularly um, repetition of bad behavior. Yeah, I I I would I I would agree with that, and it is you know it not only um, it it's not only a a deterrent, you know, the specific deterrent for the defendants that the FTC is is suing, but also for others that are thinking, oh, you know, this is a great way to make money. Um, 
And, you know, I can like go right under the wire and nobody's going to catch me. Um, but, you know, kind of knowing that the risks, if you get caught are very significant. Exactly. Exactly. And then I'll take my, I'll take the, I'll take the injunction. I won't do it again. And then I'll go and take my money and run. I mean, it's right. Right. I mean, that's, that is really the problem. Look, you, you know, legitimate companies that, um, that, um, make an advertising claim and maybe there's a disagreement, um, with the FTC about whether they have adequate substantiation for, for, for that claim. Um, you know, this is my view. I, I, I think using, um, 13B in those cases to, uh, to affect disgorgement, I, I don't really think that's necessary. And I don't think that that's what, um, I don't think that's how the act was, was ever initially, um, uh, kind of constructed. You know, it, it, the, the idea is those companies, you know, there's, that there may be, um, you, you know, maybe the commission thinks there should be more evidence. Maybe the company has a little bit, but not, you know, not enough, according to the FTC. Um, the, those are the cases where I think Congress said you put the company under order, and then if they violate the order, you can get, um, you can impose a penalty. Well, watch the space. I think there's going to be lots more to come on this. Certainly, we'll, the FTC will have to react, and we'll have to find a way. As you, as Lydia, as you said, it may be that there's legislation that that re- restores this in 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 whole or in part. Uh, there may be, uh, as you say, rulemaking partnerships with state AGs should be a very interesting and dynamic area. So, uh, hopefully, let's stay in touch and make sure that we um, we continue to talk about it because I think it is really important for our members. Absolutely. Um, but but in the meantime, let's let's shift gears for a second. And let me ask you, Lydia, just um you've had a you've done many, many things over the course of your career. Um, long time with the FTC as well as 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 in private practice. What advice do you have uh for younger lawyers who you know want to get into the consumer protection business? Oh, um do it. <laughs> it's um I, you know, I, I think, um, I found the work at the commission to be incredibly, uh, satisfying both in terms of the nature of the work and, um, and in terms of the colleagues that I had. And, you know, I am kind of doubly lucky because in my second career, uh, at, at Wilson, I found the same thing, uh, you know, kind of focusing on privacy and security issues, you know, just a great team at the, at the law firm. And we miss Elise and, um, uh, and, and, you know, kind of really interesting issues. I think, I think my, you know, kind of bigger advice is we all spend so much time at work, find something that you're passionate about, that you care about and people that you enjoy working with. I think that's really important. And, um, I mean, I, I, I take a couple things from what you said. One, do what you like. That's, that's pretty good advice. Um, and it's obviously you, you like doing the consumer protection work and the privacy and security work now. Um, do it with people you like because that makes it a lot more fun to do and then find other things to do as well because that makes you well rounded. I mean, I think it, I think that's, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty solid good advice. advice. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, then then let's ask you let's ask you the hardest question we typically ask our guests, which is tell us something interesting about yourself that we wouldn't know if we only knew you professionally. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that is that that is a hard question. Um so um you know, I always say I'm such a boring person. Okay, uh t- something that uh people would not know about me. Um I um I watch friends every night before I go to bed. It's like, you know, kind of like the last thing I do. And, um, and I'm probably, um, I'm probably one of the Gellers. I don't know which one, but if you watch friends, you know who the Gellers are. Okay. So you're, you're, you're Ross and not Chandler or Joey. Well, I'm, I'm Ross or Monica. So, 
either either I'm 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 like a neat freak, um, Monica, or like a real nerd, which is Ross. <laughs> and either way, you you you're a big fan of Rachel. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That I think that mirrors, you know, much much of the population from the 1990s. Right. Um, yeah. um, do you ever get the Friends theme song in your head and you just can't quite get it out? Oh yeah, oh, of of course. And also, um, okay, so like no, nobody can see the room I'm I'm in now, which is a um, you know a room that I took over uh, to to turn into an office in uh, you know kind of our work at home, um, year. Um, but I also, we, you know, I also have like a great friends poster that I got at an auction. So yeah, kind of decorate with friends. So who knew that Love Lydia it. Parnies had a friends poster hanging in her office? That's right. Pre pandemic. I think very few people have had friends posters. And at least did you have one? I did not. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very few people had the friends posters in the office. I, more like the Pavomas and stuff. So mm -hmm. inter interesting times. Okay. And, and, uh, at least, do you know the friends theme song? I do. I do. Yeah. I also watch friends quite a bit. Um, so I was going to ask Lydia, were Ross and Rachel on a break? Oh yeah. And if you watched the, <laughs> um, if, if you, if you watched, um, the friends reunion, even Rachel I agreed. Haven't yet. Uh, you should. You should. Oh, spoiler! Spoiler. Jennifer Aniston. She agreed. They were really on a break. All right. Well, it's good to get some. some get that settled after all of these years. <laughs> Who knew we were going to settle that topic? Okay, let's go to our final segment that we call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. In normal times when we are together, we have an actual hat. And in the actual hat, there are actual questions. And I'm, we typically give the guests the hat. And we have different hats for different occasions. But we give the guests the hat. They pull a question out of the hat. And I read it and they answer it. Since we're not together in person, I'm gonna I have a list of the questions. And I'm going to ask you to choose a number from 1 to 25. And I will read that question that corresponds with that number. Okay, I'm going to go with 17. 17. Okay, 17. Here it is. What is your favorite vacation destination? Oh, my goodness. Well, at, at this point, I would probably almost say any place um, uh, because it would be so wonderful to go on vacation. But I, I, I think I would have to say um, Paris. Be best, okay. best place. So I should have made the question a little clearer. I mean, pre-pandemic, Paris would be your favorite because I think post-pandemic, it's like going to the grocery store. Yeah, uh, is like yeah. everybody's favorite oh, yeah. destination at this point. I mean, it's absolutely. anything. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but 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 why Paris? What is it about Paris that's special? Oh, it's it's um, so I I didn't um, go there until much later um, in in my life uh, and. I'm a New Yorker. So I really, I grew up in New York, go back there a lot. I love, um, kind of a, a metropolitan, uh, destination. I don't know. It just, the vibe, it was, uh, g going through kind of tiny streets and, uh, and just, um, you know, kind of wandering around the city, incredibly walkable, wonderful food. Mm -hmm. I love the cheese in particular. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Is there any cheese in Paris that's orange? Elise. Because <laughs> that seems to be the kind of cheese that we have in around here. It also, <laughs> um, I guess that's why they call it American cheese. Um, the, the, but so I and, and 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 true this is really true. Uh basically the one French word I know is fromage. That is it's French. The, it's the one you need the most, I think. <laughs> well, with that, thank you for listening and we will see you next time on Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam. 
a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.